Hi, y'all. Um, good evening. Um, what I'm going to do today is I am going to show you how to use the, um, the, the Prisma or preferred writing or reporting um, items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And um, in doing so, I will give you a brief introduction to what is meant by Prisma, um, what are the steps that are involved in conducting a meta-analysis, and then I'm going to show you the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis on a live document for a project that um, we are doing. By we, I mean uh, Professor Bob Reid, Associate Professor um, Joanna Kunz and myself and uh, other um, research assistants We are involved in the project. Where we are looking at the um, several psychosocial interventions in workplaces for employee wellness. Now you can see on the screen two um, Word documents. One is showing you a couple of boxes, etc. And on the right hand side of this screen, you can see a title of the proposed paper that we're working on, where we are looking at a systematic review of the effectiveness of mindfulness meditation for increasing work productivity and reducing anxiety depression in the workplace. We will use this particular document um, to illustrate the main principles of what is referred to as um, PRISMA or preferred uh, reporting um, items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Now this was framed in the year 2009 and thereafter it has been revised several times. The latest version is 2020. The full specifications are not yet released on the PRISMA website. So let me quickly show you that if you want to go and visit the PRISMA website, this is where you will end up uh, heading to. This is called the Prisma website. This is their home um, homepage. And you can see that the Prisma stands for Transparent Reporting of Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analysis. And the term Prisma itself stands for Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analysis. It, um, um, it is a part of a, uh, a couple of organizations, the Prospero, which is the International Prospective Register of Systematic Reviews, and Equator Network, where different types of reviews are uh, collated, reported, and worked and researched on. And so, um, so here is what is referred to as a Prisma statement. And in the Prisma statement, you will see that there are some links that you can study in terms of um, the Prisma statement proper. So let's uh, click up and bring it up. The Prisma, Prisma statement proper was published in 2019, nine, and it has got two um, essential entities. These are called a checklist and a flow diagram. So let's take a look at the checklist first. The checklist is essentially a, um, a, a Word document that uh, gives you um, uh, a Word document or a PDF document that gives you what are the 27 items that you must include in a Prisma um, formatted systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, we will go over the checklist in a bit. And then there is a uh, thing called a flow diagram. We will also show you in the process what is a flow diagram. The flow diagram uh, provides a visual uh, depiction of the different phases of the systematic review. Um, it maps out the number of records identified, included, excluded, and the reasons for exclusions. And these are derived from a protocol that you must write in order to um, use the Prisma or preferred reporting items in a meta-analysis. Now, Prisma has, a, uh, has quite an important um, historical vignette to it because um, several studies were uh, identified in the past, in before 1990s, um, where you could see that you know over 130, 140 reviews uh, were um, systematic reviews were um, reviewed themselves, and they found that in many situations uh, the authors who wrote the systematic reviews did not include the items that would have improved the transparency and reproducibility of their um, of their um, um, of their research. So in 1999. An international group referred to as the Quorum, um, or Quality of Reporting of Meta-Analysis, was established that looked at what would be uh, the preferred items that must be included in every meta-analysis of randomized controlled trial. Now, 
in health fields such as behavioral sciences or you know in in medical sciences in public health sciences um, meta-analysis of systematic reviews um, and randomized control i mean meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials have a very special place because a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials essentially indicate that the um, that the the quality of evidence is very high or the, or set at the highest because systematic reviews are best epidemiological study designs that can um, that can be used for a um, for deducing a cause and effect model or for example studying the effect of specific interventions and therefore um, um, randomized control trials and systematic reviews of randomized control trial improve not only the reproducibility of the results, but also it improves the fact that many different randomized controlled trials conducted at different, um, in, in, in different places by different researchers under different conditions might provide some sort of a consistency in what we want to get. But the real problem is this, that in many intervention outcome uh, pairing studies, you will not see that there is a consistent result that can, um, that can be reported. And where there is inconsistency in order to resolve those inconsistencies or in order to get a summary estimate based on individual results of the individual studies, it is, um, it is ideal that such results should be combined together, which is the principle of uh, statistically combined together, which is a principle of uh, systematic review meta-analysis. In systematic review, that is um, achieved um, in a more qualitative and descriptive um, analysis of individual studies, whereas in a meta-analysis, statistical pooling by weighting the studies in some way is achieved. Now, prior to 2009, um, even after the enactment or establishment of a quorum or quality of reporting of meta-analysis, there was no guarantee that the authors would be forming them, nor was there a um, nor was there a consistency for 10 years it continued that several authors kind of adhered to the quorum principles but not quite followed exactly all the reporting items so in 2009 the guideline was updated and then, then they re-christianed it as prisma that is preferred reporting items of systematic reviews and meta-analysis so let's now go and take a look at what do these two things mean, i.e. the checklist and a flow diagram. And later on, I'm going to show you how um, you know, authors often describe each of these individual items. So um, suppose that we are um, going to conduct a systematic review and a meta-analysis of the effectiveness of mindfulness meditation for increasing work productivity and reducing anxiety depression in the workplace. So the first thing that we would like to do is let's bring up the, uh, the statement here. Um, in other words, the, the checklist statement here. And uh, let me uh, um, magnify this a little bit so that it becomes quite easy for you to take a look at this. So you can see from the right hand to left hand side, you can see that there are, um, there are, there are, there are three columns or four columns here. And when you are reviewing a systematic review or meta-analysis, if you are adhering to Prisma, then you will be able to report that on a page number of the manuscript. Likewise, if you are one of the writing team members, then it is useful and helpful if at the end of drafting of our first or second or third draft, whatever that stage may be, or even at the stage of final draft, if we could agree together to find out in which page items we have reported each of these reported, um, you know, preferred reporting items. And from the left to the right, the columns go like this. The specific section slash topics are kept on the left-hand side. There is a des description of the checklist item uh, so that you can kind of get a rough idea about what items to include where and then in which page that has been reported. So let's set it aside for a time being and let's take a look at um, how each of these things are, um, are, are presented in a particular document or in a work in progress. Now, this is a work in progress, as I stated, and we conducted a systematic review or meta-analysis uh, of a number of studies that looked into psychosocial interventions for achieving employee wellness 
in workplaces. We selected for this meta-analysis systematic review, if we were to study, say, the impact of mindfulness-based meditation that is offered in a workplace setting, how would that increase or impact the employee work productivity and how would that contribute to reduction of anxiety and stress and depression in the workplace? So this becomes the title of our systematic review or meta-analysis. And as it says in the title that we must identify the report as a systematic review, meta-analysis or both. What is missing here is that we left it as systematic review, but if we have reported the, the uh, if we have conducted a meta-analysis, then we should probably write it something like a systematic review and meta-analysis of the effectiveness of mindfulness meditation for increasing work productivity and reducing anxiety depression in the workplace. You can write the systematic review and meta-analysis anywhere in the title. It can be written after a colon, or it can be written as a, as a, as a subhead, or you can uh, straight away write it and refer to it as a meta-analysis, um, probably ideally with a hyphen. They have not mentioned this, but it is, um, it is a good practice to list the authors and the institution where the work was conducted. The second item that they insist on writing is what is referred to as, a, uh, as, as an abstract. And the abstract must have, um, must have several elements which are in the form of um, elements to be included. So we have used abstract as a level two heading, and then we have included each of these elements. In other words, include the background. And in background, it is, um, it, is, it is kind of expected that we will set the scene. Um, normally, a meta-analysis or a systematic review is commissioned or conducted either to resolve differences amongst the various studies that are conducted on the same topic, or in those situations where um, individual studies return different values, then uh, in order to identify a summary estimate, that can be then used as, a, as, as an evidence of the overall um, you know, effect or impact of the intervention on the particular outcome. The second thing that we are doing is what is referred to as a, the objectives of the review. In other words, why was this review conducted? So quite often this is either to resolve specific uh, problems. And just to um, back up on the background information, in the background information, it's a good idea to specifically indicate the population on which you're working, the intervention, and the specific outcome that you want to achieve. In our case, that would be um, the employee population who are um, in, in, in various workplaces, uh, the intervention such as mindfulness-based meditation, which is a subsystem or subset of um, um, you know, psychosocial intervention, and um, stress reduction in the form of anxiety or depression, as the specific outcome, perhaps some notes about how these are measured, how these are affected, what do we know about previous studies, what is missing, what is it that we want to do. And that point, we write the objectives of this meta-analysis or systematic review. In data sources, briefly we mentioned that we will be searching PubMed, UC Library, other databases, and what are the sources of the randomized control trials. We specify what studies are eligible for this exercise. In other words, studies that are published in English language, studies that have got certain number of sizes, that have only studies, say employees, workplaces, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then we um, specify which participants we have included for the studies. In this particular case, we state that the participants for our studies will be employees um, you know, in, in, in workplaces who are in active employment, um, and so on. Intervention will be mindfulness meditation for me, any form of mindfulness meditation, because mindfulness meditation can come in the form of either meditations, practices, mindfulness-based stress reduction workshops. So um, we will be including that. Um, one thing that you um, understand that we have not really, they have not really um, included here are the comparison groups and the outcomes. Um, uh, it is not entirely clear to me um, why they have not done that, but it's a good idea to use this. Then they said the study appraisal and the synthesis methods. Very briefly, we say that what have we done in order to appraise the quality of 
um, individual studies or uh, studies across an outcome and what synthesis methods that we have used for systematic review. They are just narrative summaries of the individual studies. For meta-analysis, it's a formal test of the heterogeneity of the studies. And then based on the results of the heterogeneity, we select specific models or we then synthesize or not decide to synthesize uh, the individual results. And then we examine the, um, what studies were left out. We uh, report publication bias, we run subgroup analysis, we do meta regressions, and all of these things briefly go in, in these uh, few subsections. Then we explain the results. Usually we give the most important findings, and then we write uh, short notes about the limitations of the studies that we have conducted, which here, refers to the limitations of individual studies and overall limitation of our study itself. And then the conclusions as to what do we uh, conclude or how do we want to use these results. And these can be either in the form of conclusions or implications of the key, fi key um, findings. One point that is quite important is the registration number. It is always encouraged that before commencing or actually conducting any meta-analysis, you must register it. Uh, there are a number of registration units where you can go and sign up and register your trial. We tend to do use uh, Open uh, Science um, Foundation's osf.io's registration page where you can go and register your study. Um, registration is always important. In particular, uh, most people these days conduct uh, randomized control trial based meta analysis using Cochrane collaboration. When you do this, Cochrane requires that you should be uh, writing a protocol. And when you write a protocol, that protocol then gets registered as you study, which you then follow up once the protocol gets approved. A very similar um, um, you know, activity is followed in, uh, in, in, in Campbell collaboration as well. In Campbell collaboration, the idea is to conduct systematic reviews. And in systematic reviews too, you have to present first a protocol for conducting the systematic review. And then if that protocol is approved, then the author group moves to conduct the actual review and in each case, you get a registration number and that registration number should be registered in here. And because uh, this is a standard set of requirements and criteria set up by the PRISMA, the Equator Network, the Prospero trial groups, all journals that subscribe to that philosophy will accept or will ask you for registration number if you have one. If you have not registered a protocol, then of course this will be, um, left as non-applicable or not available or anything like that, or, but at least you mentioned that the trial was not registered or the, or, or, or the meta-analysis system review was not registered at the time of submission. Now we get into the more uh, details and nitty gritty of conducting or writing or filling in the PRISMA form. So we have an introduction section. In the introduction section, we, um, we write the rationale for conducting uh, this this meta analysis it is usually in the form as to what is missing what do we know about the role of mindfulness based meditation in workplaces um, it could be that what do we know about mindfulness based meditation for um, bringing about um, reduction in stress anxiety depression amongst the amongst people and then we go and rationalize that although we know a fair bit of the effectiveness of mindfulness meditation in general members of the public. We may not know much about those specific settings. Or we can take another line and say that although we know much about the effectiveness of mindfulness-based meditation in workplace settings, we may not know enough to make a comment about um, what would be a summary estimate. So that's why we are doing this. Or we can say that even though we know a fair bit about the effectiveness of mindfulness-based meditation in workplaces, the results can be conflicting and if the results are conflicting, then there is a case to resolve these inconsistencies. And therefore, we can either conduct a systematic review or meta-analysis, as the case may be. And then we move on to objectives to say that the objective of this review is to collate and synthesize evidence, and we present it that we will be looking at individual studies, then we will be synthesizing and extracting the results and presenting a final um, number. <clears throat> the methods of, uh, of the studies comes next. And the first uh, item there is um, registration of the protocol. And in our case, the protocol of this research is available in opensciencefoundation.io, osf.io website, where, we have, where we, we, we have started the registration process. We will pre-register the study. There are protocols and steps in place for pre-registration of such trials. 
which essentially involves writing the background and the method section of the study that we will be using, save for the results, of course, we don't know at that point. And the point to note here is this, that when we do this, um, we are allowed to deviate from the protocol that we register. So it is not that the protocol is written in stone. Um, as long as there are reasonable deviations from the protocol with justifications, then um, it is a good practice because it improves reproducibility, readability, and you know, um, replicability of the studies. The full strategy of at least one database must be presented. Ideally, one must present the full search strategy in the form of a separate table um, and in an appendix. If you want to present the full search strategy for everything, then you put it in an appendix. Uh, otherwise, just present the full uh, search strategy for at least one um, database. So people search different kinds of databases as information sources, PubMed, Medline, Ovid. In our case, we also search the UC library. We work in collaboration with Margaret Patterson, who is our um, information specialist at UC library for health sciences. And she guided us in searching the, um, the, 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 the articles that we should be including as, uh, as randomized control trials. So we could take a subset of those randomized control trials and we'll say that these are the studies that we had identified. Then we have to describe in detail the data collection process, which means which items that we are reporting from each of the study, but how did we collect them? Now, different um, meta-analysis teams, different system review teams, use different kinds of strategies. Some teams form a, uh, a Google Doc or maybe a spreadsheet in which they enter each of the items from the individual studies and then put them together, which means usually the author's inf information, the, the study ID, the year information, the PCOS, which is the population, the intervention, the comparator, the outcomes, um, and, and, and any other notes that goes with it, uh, the results, all of these things go into the, into, the, into the data abstraction bit, plus any other identifying or other kinds of information that can help us to identify the quality of the study. All of these things go into databases, how those databases are constructed, um, what kind of um, uh, say spreadsheets or what kind of databases do we do with this, they go into the data collection process. Data items are the ones that we, um, that we report. Uh, in other words, the authors, the first author's first, uh, last name, uh, the year of the publication, the setting in which the study was done, the country or the population, the specific intervention, the comparator, the outcomes, uh, the point estimate of the results for each of these outcomes that are listed there in the study, the 95% confidence interval, the p-value, and any other notes that we may want to include get into the data items. The next item in the menu is risk of bias of individual studies. Now this is distinct from an outcome-based risk of bias ascertainment, which we will touch in a bit. Risk of bias in individual studies is this, that each study is taken up one by one and read closely um, you know, with, with the different members of the research team, uh, or sometimes one member of the research team reads them, and then they enter it into another set of forms to identify what kind of um, risks to the bias were reported in the study, which means that um, if it is a randomized controlled trial, it is not unusual to find that authors may often are biased in terms of, um, of, of, of how they select participants, because although randomized controlled trials are great study designs for um, controlling confounding variables, they're not very good at controlling or eliminating biases. There can be selection biases, there can be reporting biases, there can be biases because, because people switched the intervention and control sides, in which case whether the authors employed an intention to treat analysis or whether they used a power protocol analysis needs to be taken care of. And intention to treat analysis is this, that the authors or, or, or the analysts analyze the data in the same order in which the randomization was conducted. In other words, once randomized, always analyzed. But in power protocol analysis, quite often the final tally of the people in the intervention and control arms are taken into account for um, running the analysis and results. And there are risks and benefits of each one of these. If the authors have conducted an intention to treat analysis, then this is noted. This is a good um, insurance against any form of bias of, um, of the analysis or information bias. 
<clears throat> Other than that, in randomized controlled trials, particularly in control trials and clinical control trials, you will often see use of opaque envelopes, blinding, all of these things are important. One particular item that is uh, particularly important for reporting of bias for individual studies of randomized controls is whether the authors have actually conducted a randomization using a random, ran, random numbers table or random number generators, or are there reasons that we must be aware of when we are assessing the risk of biases in the randomization that the randomization itself was not properly done. So this is for each individual study. So we list each individual study, and in each case, we ascertain what is the risk of bias. It can be a narrative set of tables and statements. <clears throat> then what do we do is we report the summary measures. In other words, in case of a systematic review, there is no such concept of a summary measure because we do not statistically pull the results. In a meta-analysis, we statistically pull the results, and therefore, there is a notion of presenting a summary measure. This is usually in the form of an odds ratio if there is a binary or ordinal outcome, or it could be in the form of a difference or risk difference if it is in the form of scaled scores. Um, it could be in the form of D scores in our case um, because the, um, the, the outcomes were measured using scales which had um, Cohen's D in some cases. We could uh, use a standardized uh, score difference which is summarized across the studies and the studies are weighted. So those summary measures are presented. And then the synthesis of results. Um, how do we synthesize the studies uh, is something that we must explain uh, quite clearly. Um, therefore, in this, in this step or in this, in this part of the document, we explain quite clearly what steps of meta-analysis that we have, what, what have we done? So how have we examined the heterogeneity among the studies? What, have, what measures have we used? Have I used I-squares or Q-statistic? Um, whether we have used, um, um, you know, what kind of, uh, what, what strategy for weighting the studies have we used? Um, how have we collected the summary results? How have we constructed the uh, forest plot? What have we done in order to uh, examine for publication biases? What have we done for meta regressions and uh, sensitivity analysis? Uh, all of these things step by step are presented in the synthesis of results. The next two items, well, the synthesis of results and additional analysis could be kind of put together, but we could separate them um, <clears throat> for the sake of reporting purposes. And then for the risk of bias across studies basically indicate that we select an outcome and on the basis of one outcome, we select X number of studies. The philosophy here is this, that we do this because we know that one study can contain a number of outcomes and one outcome can, can be mapped onto a number of studies. So how do we resolve this? Is this that we take one particular outcome, we take in number of studies, and we put the studies together and see that for that particular outcome, what is the quality of evidence? Now, the standard for this is to establish or use a system called GRADE, which is a, um, a, is a, a quality rating criteria per outcome um, for a development of uh, guidelines and, um, you know, development of, um, you know, mainly for development of guidelines, which are based on uh, systematic reviews and collation of uh, research synthesis. And so this is what we describe, and we repeat the same things with the results section. In the results section, it's very important that we show them quite clearly as to how or what we have done in order to get the studies. How did we get the study at the various stages of the study conduct? So let me show you that and show you how we can, um, we can um, find out uh, these tools. So this is our PRISMAS re re um, referral um, things. And here is what is known as the PRISMA flow diagram that was devised in 2009, but this is pretty much standard till, till date. And here you can see that if we move from top to bottom, we see that how have we identified the studies? That is, how did we identify the records of database searching in initial stages? And then what have we done? Um, how have we uh, identified additional records to other sources? This is important because this means that these items were recorded or these records were identified <clears throat> based on our initial database searches. Then we read, um, you know, individual studies, 
and we found out that additional studies could be included based on the reference lists of those studies that we had, um, we had initially identified, and then they get into the pool. And then at that point, we have got um, records after we have removed the duplicates. And then after we remove the duplicates, we um, find out um, the various ways in which we exclude the records. And there are exclusion criteria which we apply and which state that, look, you know, this study is excluded for, this number of studies are excluded for these reasons and so on and so forth. And then finally, we get to appraise the full text articles of those ones that remain. And then um, even amongst them, we can exclude the full text uh, articles based on the fact maybe that they have incomplete reporting, that they are inappropriate, uh, whatever, the whatever the title in the abstract promised is not fulfilled in the body of the research, extremely low quality of work, et cetera, et cetera. So those, a few um, full text articles will be, uh, will be excluded even with that stage with reasons. Then we include the studies in qualitative synthesis. Usually this is the case at the step at which um, systematic review stops, uh, but whether it's a systematic review or meta-analysis, um, qualitative synthesis basically means that we narratively synthesize the main um, messages of each study, and then we, uh, we include as many studies uh, that are there. Now, some studies will include enough quantitative information for us to then proceed to the next stage, which is quantitative analysis. Now, if you're not doing a meta-analysis, then you do not need this arrow in this box. You have to exclude this. But if you're doing a meta-analysis, then you must include this. Sometimes these two numbers can be equal. Usually this number is larger than this number, depending on the specific situation and the question that we are studying. So this goes into your um, result presentation in a study selection. And I have included this here, as you can see. In our case, we have put it in the, uh, in the bottom of the, um, of, of the document. <clears throat> so the next entry is study characteristics, which basically means that for each study, we describe the study in great details and show that, look, you know, this is the study, this is the, this is how, this is the author, this was the population that we, they studied, the intervention, the comparison groups, the outcomes, and then we write a short note on the quality appraisal of the study and how this, is this study is going to be important. But we, we, um, we can confine ourselves to every information that we can get from that particular study rather than putting our own impressions. Then we report with tables, the risk of bias within the studies. I've already explained this a, a short while ago, that in this case, you take each individual study and try to see what kind of bias might have been in that particular study. And so we create a table for that. And then we tabulate the results of individual studies, which means that how many people were included, what was the intervention arm, how many people were, were included in the intervention arm, what was the control arm, how many people were, how many participants were included in the control arm, what was the summary estimate, what was the crude estimate, what was the adjusted estimate, what was the p-value, what was the 95% confidence interval, all of these things go into these tables. Then we report the synthesis of the results, which means that at that point, we definitely include the forest plot and we include a table that accompanies the forest plot, including the diamond and the summary measures and summary estimates that uh, show us the summary or pooled estimate as a result of that meta-analysis. And then we state another table in which we then based on the specific outcome that we have studied, we report a grade table that rates the studies in terms of the quality. Now, earlier they used to be called quality scores. Increasingly, the term quality score is now replaced with a certainty score, which means that a study is of high quality when we have got sufficient confidence in that study that no additional research is needed to understand the, um, the uh, whether that particular intervention is effective for that particular outcome. That outcome can, can be a harmful outcome, that outcome can be a beneficial outcome. There are standardized um, uh, forms that are used from the GRADE and GRADE Pro website. Uh, perhaps at a future session, I can show you how to use GRADE and GRADE Pro. And then what you do is this, that um, uh, you know, if you have done uh, additional analysis, such as um, meta-regression, sensitivity analysis, those then get, get to show be, 
yet to be shown at in this particular section. At the end of this um, <clears throat> process, we write the discussion of the document. And in our case, we'll be summarize the main findings of the, or the overarching findings first. And then we write about the strength of evidence for each group. In other words, in our case, there's only one group that is, um, you know, people who are employed. However, if you find that there are subgroups within the employed uh, population, then for each subgroup of employees, we will be pressing the results separately and we will be summarizing those evidence and we'll be giving an overarching review or view of what the evidence landscape looks like. Finally, we talk about the limitations and conclusions. The limitations would include, um, we discuss the risk of bias of the individual studies because the summary of the limitation of a study is kind of the sum total or more than a sum total of the individual studies. And, um, and, and definitely we talk about publication biases, what could have been done in order to minimize publication biases. It is almost a given that almost all systematic reviews and meta-analysis are open to publication biases. There are very few that are not. Um, if we have identified that we have covered small studies, we have covered um, uh, you know, negative studies, if we have covered studies that give us equivocal results equally as well, as we have identified strong big studies, then that's great and we must highlight those accomplishments. If not, then we have to acknowledge and state that this review is open to publication bias and this needs to be corrected in future. And we have to explain what we have done uh, to understand the, how to detect the fugitive studies, the studies that were lost and what can be done in future to um, understand them. And then we can do, um, if we have run, uh, subgroup analysis that have addressed some of these limitations and we address them there. Finally, the conclusions that are assessed using the PRISMA um, chart is, is the general interpretation, the results and the implications of the studies. And then we describe what are the sources of funding. So those 27 items must be reported in a PRISMA or in a meta-analysis to fulfill the PRISMA requirements. Journal editors and reviewers go by them. And I have seen that in systematic reviews and meta-analysis, the ones that I have written and authored, if we have, if, if one or two of these items are missing, then the reviewers point them out and ask you to fill in. If you cannot fill them in, then they, quite often the, the submissions are rejected. The quality of systematic reviews uh, depend on the fidelity with which these 27 items are reported. Of course, this is true for everything that we talk in the context of health and healthcare. In other disciplines, the rules might be different, but remember that this is based on the equator network and, um, and, 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 and the quorum criteria and, and that the kind of Prospero uh, trial setting, um, which has got very definite um, criteria. So, um, so I think I'm going to stop there. And um, so um, I'd, be happy to, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to take questions um, unfortunately, I'm not present here today in, in person, but if you can ask those questions to Bob and the team and they can answer them, otherwise um, we are more than happy to come back and address them if I receive your emails. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you.